It needs no rehearsal of a group of people singing and every word uh, means everything to every one of us. And uh, what I love about the choir in heaven is that uh, you get a lot of exercise too because you keep falling down on your face and then getting back up and falling down. And it's, uh, it'll be wonderful to be agile, healthy, um, and not in a hurry, just to endlessly be able to enjoy God. Revelation chapter 1 is Christ's last words to his church. Uh, this is Jesus Christ assuring us, his servants, uh, of who he is after the resurrection, that's chapter one, of what he sees in his church that he has left here to represent him on the earth, and from chapters four onward, what he has planned. And, and it's so wonderful to see the, the great culmination when we are at the ultimate communion service and the ultimate banquet of all times uh, when we join in with all the redeemed of all the ages. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible book. But in chapter one, Jesus wants us, first of all, to see him as he is in his resurrection power and glory as it relates to us today. And, and it, it is such an incredible insight into how he wants to reveal himself. Last week we saw verse 13, and you can look at verse 13 in your Bibles. That was uh, John turning to see the voice, he heard a voice, and he wanted to see who was talking, and when he turned in verse 13, he saw these lampstands, verse 20 tells us they represent the church, and then he saw, and that description is one like the son of man uh, with this long robe that reaches down to his feet, and it girded about his chest, and, and it was this concept that as soon as he saw Jesus, he saw him as the compassionate, perfect, come to any time, loving priest. I'm so glad that was the first sight of Christ because verse 14 is completely different. In verse 14, he sees when he, when he focuses in on that one like the Son of Man, he sees the other side of the equation. Jesus is not only 100% perfect humanity with arms open wide and compassionately saying, come to me just like you are, I will never condemn you, I will never, never push you away, come to me. That's verse 13. But when he kind of focuses a little more closely, he sees him as the ancient of days. That's the white head and hair, white as snow and like wool. And then he, he looks and almost begins what we see later on in the passage. He, he collapses after he sees Christ in this, this sight because he sees those eyes. And the eyes of Jesus, he said, are like burning flames of fire. And when he sees that, he realizes the, the desire Jesus has for the atmosphere of heaven. Do you remember what heaven is like? Every time, like when Isaiah went up there, all he heard was holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Revelation 4, 8, that's what they're chanting over and over again. And that holiness Jesus is looking for in us. See, that's, that's the message. Uh, when John turned to see who it was that spoke to him, he turned and saw the Ancient of Days himself in all his power, in all his holiness, with those eyes ablaze with inescapable and penetrating sight. And that's how Jesus, the risen Lord, appears at this moment as we, this morning, gather before him. So let that sight get imprinted on your heart. Christ's flaming eyes of penetrating holiness. Think about that. That is how he wants us to think of him when we gather as a church. He has penetrating sight. He can see past the smile. He can see past all the cultural accoutrements and he sees who we really are on the inside. And he's measuring how much of the inside of us is under his control. You know, we, we uh, read the war reports, you know, and, and uh, I think it was last week or the week before we, we pulled out of some valley in Afghanistan. They said it took too many troops, cost them too many lives, too many wrecked, everything's and helicopter gunships and everything because this valley is so hard to get in and out of that 
they just pulled out of it in Afghanistan. They said it's too big of an expense. And so on the map of Afghanistan, the Pentagon keeps looking at areas that are under control and areas that aren't under the control. And this area went from under control to not under control. Did you know in a real sense, the Lord looks at each one of us and it's like a battleground between the devil controlling our appetites and desires and intentions and, and, and thoughts and, and has our attention or the Lord completely controlling that sector. And that's what those blazing eyes are. He's saying, I am the holy, infinite God. And I want you to cooperate with my desire to control you fully. In the Old Testament world and in the New Testament era, white always signified purity, but also had another, another backdrop, and that's what we see in Revelation 7. Because when the Ancient of Days is seen on that throne, do you remember the throne in, in Daniel 7, 9, and 10, that, that Jesus is sitting on, and there's fire, a river of fire flowing out from under that throne? The fire speaks of the purifying, nothing impure can be in his presence. And he is shown to be clothed in white raiments and clothed with white hair over his head. And even his, his head, his, his skin appears this white purity. That concept is, is the idea he wants to communicate to us of purity. The first point John makes as he details Christ to us is those eyes as a flame of fire. Speaking of the power fire has to purify, but also the power that fire has that nothing can stand before it. I mean, John knew that, that before he got exiled on, on the island of Patmos, the Romans had come through that massive temple. Remember Jesus had, had taught in the temple? That temple had the largest suspended arch of the ancient world. Never was Herod's engineering feat of this vast span of this uh, 80 or 90 foot archway that was made of, of solid rock that was hanging out over space, making a bridge to the temple. And when the Romans came, they said, we're going to show the engineering marvel of Herod is very weak. And they built a fire under it. And the fire, the heat went up, expanded the air in the limestone, and it cracked, crumbled, and its own weight crushed that massive archway. See, fire is powerful. Fire refines and finds the weak spots. Fire purifies. And Jesus said, my eyes of fire have both power and purity. And the purifying work of fire that consumes and eats through and takes away the dross is what I want you to know. I am the unstoppable, all-powerful Ancient of Days. And I'm visiting you in my church. And I'm looking to see if there are unpurified areas of your life. Because when I bought you, I bought you to sanctify every part of your life. So John sees this. And he, he looks at Christ in the second of the... Now, remember, these are twin descriptions. Verse 13 has two elements, one like the Son of Man wearing this robe. Verse 14 has two elements, the one with these, these white hair and white head and with these eyes of fire. And so these twin portraits of Christ are to remind us Jesus, the all-compassionate, all-loving high priest, is also the all-holy Lord of our lives. Jesus is always the first one we can come to, to cry out to and share our struggles with. And we need to hold on in our hearts this great truth. Jesus will never condemn us. Remember, Jesus said there's no sin that's unforgivable. He said it, Mark 3, 28. You should write it down and mark that one in your Bible. Next time you meet someone uh, that comes to you and thinks they've committed the unpardonable sin, they can commit it if they persist in rejecting Christ because he will never forget someone, forgive someone who rejects him to the end. But the, the unforgivable sin was localized to only those who saw God in human flesh walking this earth. And when they looked at Jesus healing people that had leprosy, putting eyes back in blind people, putting limbs back on people that were missing limbs from, from horrible degenerating diseases, when they looked at God in the face, humanly speaking, 100% God, 100% man, when they looked at him and said, you are not God, you're using the power of the devil, he said, I'll never forgive you for that. But that's the only sin that's unforgivable other than lifelong persistent rejection of Christ. So remember, Jesus always has his arms all open wide, 
We can always share our struggle with him, and he will never condemn us. He showers on us compassion and intercession. Always remember, when you think of Jesus, his arms of compassion and love. When you think of Jesus, think of his arms stretched out. You know, that's the last image on the cross. His arms were nailed as wide as they could get. And that's the picture to the world. That's the last time they saw him, the world. Now, the next time they see him, he's going to be coming in judgment. But if they will look on the one whose arms, his arms of compassion and love. So God first wants us as his servants who struggle through life to see Jesus as a compassionate priest. He ever lives to pray, encourage, and help us. But this morning, in verse 14, God wants us to focus on something else. That once you come to that compassionate priest who will never turn us away and never reject us and never condemn us, He looks us over and says, now that you belong to me, I want you to allow me to sanctify you by my spirit I've placed within you. Revelation 1, we're going to read verses 14 through 17, and notice what John saw about Jesus, and we'll learn about verse 14 this morning. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Remain standing. We're going to pray after that, and then jump into this passage. Revelation 1.14 says, and notice his is repeated seven times. You want to do a little study, circle the his is, because we're going to look at each of these elements. Number one in verse 14, his head and hair, that's Jesus, were white like wool, as white as snow. And here's another one, his eyes like a flame of fire. Verse 15, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars, And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. In verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and on it goes. What a beautiful picture John sees of his head, his hair, his eyes. His mouth, his hands, his feet, his voice. And he says, this is how I want you to remember Christ today. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray that we would be confronted with your ancient of days purity and power and of your blazing eyes of fire that want to sanctify us fully. And help us to know that you are pleased when we cooperate and yield and surrender and allow you to work in our lives. And you are displeased and even grieved through your spirit when we resist. And Lord, I pray that we would at this communion surrender, renew, and consecrate ourselves to your sanctifying work. Teach us, move us, stir us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're seated, the sight of Jesus looking at us with those fiery eyes is not the most comfortable image. I'm so glad it was the second view that John had because he was, he was comforted by seeing one like the Son of Man and wearing that, that high priest outfit before he noticed those fiery eyes that were, that were piercing through him. What a truth we need to understand and respond to this morning is that Jesus is both. In fact, the psalmist, Psalm 8410 says that mercy and truth meet in Christ. Mercy, one like the Son of Man who will never condemn us. Truth, that God is forever showing his wrath against sin. And so those, those two almost seem incongruous. It, it just doesn't seem like they fit. Uh, and, and that's why some people have this kind of Old Testament view of this fiery, wrathful God and this New Testament kind of milk toast Jesus, you know? And they, they say they're too different. No, in Christ, mercy and truth meet and are perfectly joined. The one whose arms are open wide makes it completely possible for us to come and cleanses and forgives. And the one with the ancient of days, white hair and fiery eyes says, but I will not tolerate sin unchecked. In your lives. We must never forget that there is only one of God's attributes that's stated in triplicate. Remember in the old days when they used to have NCR paper and it was three, you know, triplicate? That meant it was really serious, you know, two for them and one for you. 
and you had to keep your peace because it was important. There's only one triplicate attribute of God. The angels don't go sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. They don't go love, love, love. They go holy, holy, holy. And that is not just stated in Isaiah 6. If you read Revelation 4, 8, it is the, the song, the chant, the words that are constantly echoing through heaven. There's one attribute that we see God surrounding by the threefold omnipotent holiness of God. And so this morning, this description of our Savior here in his church is to cause us to deeply ponder God's desire. Jesus is here on the ground, walking around, actually here this morning. In fact, I wouldn't speak, I would let him speak if he would appear but rather he has left his word for his messengers. Remember, he's holding the message in his right hand. That message is his word, and he asks his messengers to declare his word. The purpose for the gathering of church is for Jesus to hear his word being proclaimed to his servants and for him to walk around with those piercing eyes to see how we're responding to his word on the inside. And so this morning, the picture of Revelation 1.14 declares that Jesus desires my sanctification. And it prompts a question, are you experiencing Christ's holiness? As he's looking with those fiery eyes, is he seeing that, that there's more and more of my personality that's becoming like his, more and more of my attitudes that are Christ-like, more and more of my actions that, that correspond with his actions? Remember the early Christians? They, they called them Christians because that was actually a joke. They said they're just trying to be a little Christ. A Christian is a diminution of Christ, a little Christ. They're all little Christ. They're all acting like him. They're all talking like him. We'll call them little Christ, Christians. That's what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for us to, to be like him. Now, it's humanly impossible. That's why he's got his arms open. Why He says, hey, you found you totally can't do this on your own. You need me. And so that's why he plants his spirit within us. You know, it's amazing when Jesus described the comforter. Do you remember in Matthew, or I mean in John 14? In fact, from John 13 on, it's the last night of Christ's life on earth. John 13, he washes their feet and has communion. And then in 14, he starts edging away. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, they were catching, he was leaving. And that's why they said, wait, where are you going? He says, uh, uh, you, you know, whether you go, we know not. You know, how can we know? And that's what John 14 is about. Jesus says, I'm going to my father, but I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm gonna leave you a comforter. How did he introduce the comforter? How do you introduce the one that was gonna live inside of all believers, the one that was going to be Jesus Christ, comforting presence within each of us? How do you describe him? He called him the spirit, but there's a word before spirit. Holy Spirit. And then when we get to John chapter 20, after the resurrection, Jesus comes to his disciples and he breathes out on them. He says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And then when, when he's about to ascend into heaven in Acts chapter one, he's standing on the mountain and he says, I want you to stay in Jerusalem, tarry until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then in Acts chapter two and verse four, what does it say? There's a sound like a mighty rushing wind and they were all filled, full of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's one word. It's the first part of the name of that third person, the Trinity, that's always the same. He is called the Holy Spirit. So it's the Spirit of God living within us that is to cause us more and more to reflect Christ's holiness. That's why he left him. He left the Holy Spirit so that all of us who, who have him living within reflect his holiness. That's what the Holy Spirit is to do. Christ's flaming eyes are representing his desire that we experience the purifying work of his spirit at every level of our life. I love hearing the stories of, uh, you know, my daughter living in the jungle in Honduras. And one of the stories is about the ants. And the ants, I mean, they just, they think they own the place. They live in the jungle and they just, they're, they're just running freely. And I don't mean the little ones, I mean the big ones. And, and they will find a way into the house and they will make a road. And, and it will just be a black line, you can see it. And they're just, it's just a river of ants and they're just carrying something out of the house, you know, anything they can find to eat. And so when you come in, you have to mark out your ownership. 
and you poison them on the entryway here, and then you poison them at the other end, and then you clean and, and get rid of them. And when they try and break through, they find that things are different. They find that the, the access has been blocked by, by powerful poisons, powerful deterrents. And that when they get inside, all their trails are gone. They no longer have common ground. Did you know that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does at salvation? He comes inside of us and he breaks all the supply lines, all of the, the ways that our lust used to be fed and the chains that used to hold us down to sin. He comes and, and, and breaks all those, cleans all that stuff out, and we're fresh and new creations in Christ. And all those, those entryways are, are blocked and guarded. And then he turns over to us that brand new creation. He says, now I want you to walk. As you were saved, I want you to walk in the same way. I want you to allow me to keep all those entryways of the devil plugged. And I want you to keep those strong barriers so that sin will not have dominion over you anymore. And that process is called sanctification. It's me keeping him totally at work in my life, unhindered, ungrieved, unquenched, and me unchained and enslaved to sin. It's a cooperation that he wants to do in my life. The work of the Spirit inside of believers is not automatic. God plans for our earthly sanctification, but it must be unleashed by participation. Now, you notice I said earthly sanctification. In heaven, we will be perfected. We will never struggle with sin. In heaven, we are already in Christ seated. We are, we are perfect there, but we're still living on earth. And we have to cooperate down here. And so God has chosen for the Spirit of God to reflect his pleasure with our faithful, obedient response to the, the, the sanctifying work or his displeasure with our unbelief and disobedience. That's the work of sanctification. So, sanctification means that my body and my mind are purified. Sanctification is all about the purity of my mind and body. It's not about whether I go to church, whether I carry a Bible, whether I smile on Sunday. It's whether my mind is a dwelling place and holy and pure of God and my body is reflective of his ownership. That's what Jesus is looking at. We can't see that. You can't outwardly see if a person's a Christian. Only he can see on the inside whether the work of sanctification is progressing, controlling more and more parts of my personality. Since the third person of the Godhead is usually introduced by the word holy before the word spirit, it's clear that his primary ministry is to purge and cleanse saints from their sin. And this work of the Holy Spirit is described as sanctification. What is sanctification? An increase of my individual response to Christ's holiness, that I'm reflective of Christ. When we are saved, it's the Holy Spirit that does the complete cleansing of our hearts and of our lives. He totally severs all the connections that fed the lust and habitual sins of our lives before we were saved. Paul describes this, in fact, if you want to turn back with me to 1 Corinthians. Now you're in Revelation, go back to 1 Corinthians. And if you can't find it, you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, X, Romans, 1 Corinthians. There it is. It's easier the other direction. But look at chapter 6, verse 11. Because Paul's talking to a group of people that were desperately enslaved to sin, just like all of us were before we were saved. We're all enslaved to sin in its various forms, whether it's a sin of fear or pride or of anxiety or of haughtiness or of insensitivity or whatever. We are enslaved to our sin. But look what he says. This is the sanctifying work in new believers. Paul reminds them in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at this. And in the spirit of our God. See, he came in and washed and sanctified us. He made us fit for the dwelling place of God. He made us the temples of the living God. Amazing to think about. In fact, during the ministry of John the Baptist, one promise he made about Christ's coming was that Jesus would be the one who baptized you with the Holy Spirit and fire. See, that, that idea of fire is, is the idea of coming in and purifying, of cleaning out, of getting rid of all the stuff that's displeasing to God. That's the Holy Spirit's work. That's what Jesus came to accomplish. And when the Spirit of God is present, 
he empowers us to reflect God more and more. You're in 1 Corinthians, uh, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter three. Look at this kind of summary of what salvation is all about. This is God's plan. You wanna know what God's plan is? It's, it's, it's in one little verse. It says in, in 2 Corinthians three eighteen, but we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. What, what the images are here is uh, open face means that, that we pay attention to and we're looking at the Bible. That's what with unveiled faces beholding is in a mirror. When we look at the Bible, it's the only place where when you look at it, you see yourself as you really are. You know, a, a mirror, we only see the outward and we get so used to the outward. God says, when you look at this, you see what you really are on the inside. You know, when people are tragically disfigured through accidents, they're still the same person on the inside. We just are so shocked because they don't, we're so attached to the outside. God says, I'm all attached to the inside. And I want you to look in the mirror of the word, verse 18, and I want you, as you see what you're like on the inside, to allow me to transform you into the same image as you see in the word. What God wants us to look like, how God wants us to look, we look in the mirror of the word and we see where we are short of it and as soon as, that's, that's what Bible study with application is all about. When I see what God wants, I pause and I say, God, but that's not what I am. And, and then most people just close their Bibles. But that's when we bow before him and say, but that's what I want to be. I want you to change me. Look at this, from glory to glory. How does he change us from one level of Christ's likeness to another? just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit. Remember, God will never command me to do what he hasn't already given me grace to accomplish. We must participate in the process of sanctification. We participate by working hard at obeying God's word. That's our part. Sanctification is not like justification. Justification is what Jesus accomplished once and for all on the cross. He accomplished a a legal transference of all of our sins onto him, all the penalty onto him, and off of us. We can't do anything about that. Sanctification requires constant participation. We have to work hard at obeying God. We have to work hard at reading our Bibles. We have to pray. We have to meditate on the scripture to renew that mind. We have to memorize, share the gospel, serve in the church. We have to fast to deny our bodies, control, God commands us so many things in his word to do, but our obedience that pleases him. You see, it never says that Jesus is grieved and quenched at us because he justified us. It's the Holy Spirit that gets grieved and quenched because we are to participate with him. And we grieve and quench the Holy Spirit when we have this part of our life that, that through the word of God or through other believers or through the mechanism of the Spirit's conviction, we, we realize is wrong. We say, no, 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 I'm not going to give that up. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It quenches his work in our life. We can't sanctify ourselves. We have to rely upon and desire for the Spirit of God to conquer us by his power. When Jesus was describing the salvation he purchased for us on the cross, in John 7, verse 39, he says, out of those who come to me will flow my spirit like a river. Now think about it. The Holy Spirit is more than we could ever need. The power is more than we could ever need. The, the grace is more than we could ever use. He's like a gigantic river. And that's how Jesus describes sanctification. When the Holy Spirit is pouring out powerfully into our daily lives, sanctification means the blessings of God are completely tied to our responses. You see, God wants to pour out the blessings that, that enlarge my capacity for patience, that, that increase my ability to not get irritated by people around me, that increase his control over my tongue so I don't say things I shouldn't say, that, that increases my, my gentleness in my behavior. All of those are Christ-like qualities, and the Holy Spirit wants to flow through and cause those to occur in my life. But sanctification means the blessings of God are tied to my response. Throughout the whole Bible, we see examples of the Spirit of God blessing or removing his blessing based on whether the events were pleasing or displeasing him. When the children of Israel 
with all their frailties, would do what God wanted, he would let them win incredible battles. I mean, just a handful could make an army run. But when they displeased him, they could have the biggest army and a handful would defeat them. Because really, the victory or the loss, both were in the hands of the Lord. And God says, I want you to know that if you cooperate with me, I am pleased and I pour out my blessing. And if you don't cooperate with me, I'm displeased and I withdraw my blessing. Paul warned the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Spirit of God. He warned the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. Right here to the Corinthians, he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, don't you know that you were bought at a price, that you are the dwelling place of God, therefore glorify God in your spirit and your body, which are his, because he owns you. Our choices either grieve or offend the spirit. God does not force us to obey him, as 1 Corinthians 14, 32 tells us, but when we resist what God desires, he will withdraw his blessings he was prepared to pour upon us. So you know what that means? The motivation for my sanctification is that I know that Christ's eyes see me always. I'm aware of Christ's penetrating gaze, that those eyes of fire are looking to see whether or not I am progressing. You know what theologically what I'm talking about this morning is called? It's called progressive sanctification. There should be an increasing frequency of my response to the Spirit of God, and there should be a decreasing frequency of my response to my flesh. My flesh is being mortified, and the Spirit is sanctifying more of my life. Jesus wants us to see he's watching for us to respond to his Holy Spirit. The more we reflect the holiness of the Spirit of God, the more sanctified we become. The less we reflect His holiness, the less sanctified we become. Did you know you can travel around with a person? If 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 you just tag along with a person through a 24-hour day, you could measure their sanctification. Because if their responses to life are Christ-like, they are in the process of sanctification. If they're not, they are resisting the sanctification or they're not saved you know there's a lot of people that play church and they can only play it for about an hour they act like Christians for an hour rest of the week I mean there would be no evidence to prove they're Christian they're not sanctified well let me show you God's method and we're going to go look at 1 Thessalonians 5 last verse don't you love the last one Uh, I learned that early on when I used to pastor in New England 30 20 whatever 27 years ago whenever it was I noted something interesting. When I said, and now in conclusion, people would start getting up and leaving because they thought it was the end and they had to go open the doors and you know, fire up the coffee pots and everything. And so some of the, the people that I most wanted to talk to moved. You know? And so I learned the habit then of never saying in conclusion and I actually used to pray walking down the aisle and I'd stand by the stairs to the balcony so I would see those people I wanted to meet because they always left before. So, but for you, you're not leaving and if you do, it's okay. But 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is the end. Okay, And, and what we see in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is God's sanctification plan. Now, now understand the backdrop of, of 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul had come in for three weeks to this town that was kind of like a combination of Las Vegas and, and kind of the worst slummy downtown red light district of any city you can think of and combine that with the spirit of Mardi, Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And think of that. The glitz and flesh of Vegas and the party flaunty of, of New Orleans at Mardi Gras and then take kind of a seedy, down, slummy, you know, red light district. That's what Thessalonica was like in the first century because it was a port and a trucking city. Well, they didn't have trucks, they had, you know, carts and chariots, but it was where the largest highway that went from India to Britain, where that crossed and hit one of the most strategic ports of the ancient world. And when those two met, a port city and a big road crossing, you know what crops up. Everyone was there just briefly. And usually when people can come and go, they do things they wouldn't normally do if they were staying there. And so the sin level was high. And so Paul planted a church right in the slums in the red light district. 
and a whole bunch of people got saved. But even though the Lord had come to clean out their apartment, the ants were used to attacking it. You know, all the, the lusts were, all of the entanglements and the chains of sin were just around them. So he says in verse 23, this is my sanctification program. Now may the God of peace, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, himself sanctify you completely, and I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he says is at the moment of salvation, your lives were saved from sin, but the sanctification starts at the exact same moment. So there, in that commercial transportation hub where intercontinental caravans met at the docks of a huge seaport, in less than three weeks, a group of drunkards, a group of sex addicts, a group of greedy and dishonest business people, as well as all the normal, well-adjusted, lost pagans had come to Christ. And so what did Paul say they needed? He had to teach them the truths of sanctification. Now, you know what? If if you just draw from what Paul says to the Romans and to the Corinthians and some of the last chapters to the Galatians and a lot of Ephesians and Colossians, we know what he taught them. And for just a a minute before we go, why not choose right now to pretend that you're on a bench in the Thessalonian church and Paul is speaking and reminding you now as you leave and go back to your old life, Jesus' eyes are piercingly flames of fire watching to see whether you allow him to keep breaking the access of those old ways so they no longer dominate your life. You know what Paul told him was the, the way, the, the means of sanctification? He told him they had to, and, and this is what I like to call my personal sanctification surrender list. I need to cooperate. I have to surrender to the sanctifying process. Now, what does that surrender entail? Sanctification is a process of becoming more like Christ. When I am empowered by the Spirit, I will strive, fighting against sin, by studying the Scripture and praying. Do you know what? No matter how far we go, the message stays the same. Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word of God. You see, the only way that God can sanctify us is for us to realize it's like being healthy spiritually. Our bodies need proper nutrients combined with exercise. I mean, we just had a big seminar here yesterday, and and, and all the ladies were taught about the two things, put in the right stuff and have the right type of exercise. There's even two kinds of exercise that you need, and that's for physical health. Did you know the same is true for spiritual health? We have to have proper intake. What's proper intake? Well, number one, I want to listen daily to God through his word. Did you know I need to hear the voice of the Lord? I need to have him. His voice is what feeds my soul. Nothing else can. We can try to buy stuff. We can try to to intoxicate our souls. We can try to, uh, you know, lighten them up with with, uh, all kinds of chemicals, but there's only one thing that feeds and restores our soul. It's the voice of God. That's called his word. He talks to us through his word. So if, if I'm going to surrender to personal sanctification, number one, I have to say, God, I want to listen to you daily through your word. You know, someone told me, they said, you know what, you... You talk about that a lot. I said, you know why I talk about it a lot? It's because it's so hard. Let me just ask you, in the last seven days, did you read your email every day if you get email? Probably yes. Did you read the Bible every day? For some of you, no. How about, for those of you that are heavily into knowing weather, did you watch constantly or listen to the broadcast of the weather that's telling you that it was gonna snow yesterday? Every day, uh uh-huh. Did you listen to God's broadcast? You see, the reason I talk so much about reading the Bible every day is that we don't. So many times, everything else presses in. The first means of sanctification is I want to listen to God daily through his word. Secondly, I want to respond to God throughout the day in prayer. You know what that means? When I read in the word of God, look in the mirror, see something that God wants to change, I note that and I say, God, I ask you to give me the strength 
to, do, to change in that area. And so all day long, I, I pray and ask him to work in my life. Number three, I make sacred vows of obedience. You know, you know what that means? I actually say, Lord, I'm going to read your word first. Lord, I'm going to try and memorize a verse about my constant struggle with this or this or this so that you can change me slowly like you promised. And that's a, a vow. We talk to the Lord. We say, Lord, I'm going to be in your word first. I'm going to memorize. I'm going to start praying for my family. I'm going to start asking the Lord to give me grace before I go into that situation. I always fail in. And that, those are little vows. You know what number four is? You find someone to share those with. Did you know why the early church was so powerful? They, they were close-knit. They were a community. They were not all like marbles in a vase. Did you know if I brought a vase of marbles here and set it on the platform, they'd all look so close, but if I tipped the vase over, the marbles would spread. Nothing connects them. The modern church tries to be like the early church. We, we look like a vase. We're actually all marbles that go our separate ways. We aren't connected to people. We don't have anybody that if we're not here, they notice it. We don't have anybody that says, hey, how are you doing in your spiritual life? Are you reading the Bible? Are you praying? How are you changing? I've known you for five years. You have the same temper you had five years ago. What's going on? Isn't that a little uncomfortable to have someone say that? That's why we resist it. That's why we want to be a marble. We want to roll away. God says, no, I want you connected. I want you to have someone in your life that says, hey, you have known Christ for 30 years. You are as anxious and fearful as you were 30 years ago. What is going on? And, or someone saying, hey, you're a brand new creation in Christ. Don't lose your zeal. Let me help you. And I'll show you how to study and read. These are the offerings of obedience we can offer to the Lord. Listening to God daily, responding, making those vows to change, and sharing that with someone. So this is what we're going to do. It's time for communion. Let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts. And as we do that, the men are going to go prepare to serve us. But just as you bow before the Lord, if you have not renewed these choices lately to cultivate sanctifying habits, why not say, Lord, again, I tell you, I want to listen to you every day. I want to seek you in your word. I, I want to respond, talking to you about what I've learned in your word throughout the day in prayer. I, I want to make some choices. I do want to say, Lord, I want to stop my anxiety by your grace. I want to stop my fears. I want to stop and, and see you cut off the the lust that so easily beset me. I want to mortify my flesh. And Lord, I want to share those plans with another believer so they can encourage me. Right where you're sitting, those are four sanctifying habits that you can renew at communion. Father in heaven, thank you for this bread. It reminds us, Lord Jesus, that you gave yourself to buy us out of the slave market of sin and into becoming living sacrificial servants to you. And that's what we want, your sanctifying power in our lives today. We ask for it, and we pray for it, and your spirit longs to unleash it as we cooperate. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.